Welcome everybody to this exciting uh, jewel event, let's say, or duly organized by Our Ladies Rome and Our Ladies New York City. My name is Katie Wood, and I'm one of the chapters organizers, the Rome chapter organizer. And I'm delighted to be here with you this evening, this morning. <laughs> Uh, we'll also be uh, joined by Dorota Rizik from Our Ladies New York City, and our speakers for this event are Jacqueline Burros and Federica Gazzella. Benvenuti, uh, welcome to our, our Italian members, and hopefully we can they can keep up the pace <laughs> with the English language. There's just a couple of lines there in Italian for those who may be finding a little bit difficult in English. I'm a bit difficult. You're a bit difficult, oh dear. <laughs> um, if you will be interrupting with comments like that, we will um, exclude you from this talk. So please be respectful. There is a code of conduct that you agreed to when you joined. Thank you, Dorota. I know we have um, some veteran Our Ladies um, members with us this evening, and I also know that we have some new members. So just a little reminder for those uh, new members, what is Our Ladies? Our Ladies is a global organization with the mission of pro promoting the Our Language and the mission of empowering women um, at all user levels by building a collaborative global network. Uh, it's also a gender diversity friendly community founded in 2020 by Gabriela de Queros in San Francisco. And today it's so uh, that's uh, just over 10 years that it's a worldwide organization it's staggering 218 chapters in 29 countries and more than 93,000 members globally. So those are fantastic numbers. That's incredible. Yes. Um, and if you would like more information, please do visit the ladies.org uh, website. So uh, Our Ladies Rome is the, the this chapter here, the local chapter of uh, Our Ladies Global, and uh, it's we meet monthly and uh, to provide a platform to discuss current trends and hot topics in R. And we do encourage active participation and engagement from all our attendees. And so if you are interested in getting involved or if you have suggestions and, and comments that you'd like to share, please do get in contact with us. We'd be delighted to, to speak to you. The founder of the chapter is uh, Claudia Vitolo, and she's also the co-founder of the Our Ladies Global. The organizer of the Our Ladies Rome uh, chapter is Federica Gazzaloni, who will be speaking shortly. And I am the co-organizer, my name is Katie Wood, as I present myself. We would love to have more co-organizers co uh, join us. And I know we do have uh, some in the pipeline who are due to join us very soon. So we're very excited about that and looking forward to uh, to welcoming them on board. So uh, just a couple of dates here for you. Um, this, the, the next um, few months, the, the, these are the um, events that will be taking place. So April, we have the Our Ladies uh, New York and Our Ladies Rome, which I've just presented. Uh, next month will be um, R4DS Community Learning with uh, John Harmon. June to be decided uh, with uh, Simina Boca and July our kickstart. So there are things, there's plenty of things cooking in the pot and we'll be um, advising as they um, become uh, locked in. 
Let's have a look. We also have, as I said, this is a joint event with uh, Our Ladies New York City. And I think Dor Dorota may have something to say. Yes. yes. So similar to Our Ladies Rome, Our Ladies NYC is a local chapter of Our Ladies Global. And we are also dedicated to promoting gender, gender diversity in the R language uh, programming community. So um, we are open to all members who are interested in coding, uh, particularly with R coding. Um, and we are uh, focused on increasing representation of women and gender minorities in the global R community through meetups. Uh, we offer mentorships, collaborative learning, and uh, other supports. Our founder is Sunya Kar Kar sorry, <laughs> Karla, and um, I am the current lead organizer. Other uh, co-organizers of the NYC chapter are uh, Ayanti, Kristen, May, Jackie, who is presenting today, and Clara. And uh, we have a couple of events coming up in the next few months, but they are in-person events. So if you will be in New York City, we would love for you to join us. Um, in May, we are doing a code collaboration event uh, at a cafe, at a local cafe in NYC. And so we'll just uh, be hanging out, drinking some coffee or tea and working on personal projects together. And then in June, we have our summer social where we will just um, meet and socialize and network, uh, which is always a blast. And that's uh, what we have coming up. Fantastic, fantastic. There's also a couple of uh, conferences that are being organized for September, uh, one in Chicago, um, 17th of September, and the other in Ghent, Belgium, on the, let's have a look, is that the 20th of September. So registrations are now open, and if you're going to be in those cities, um, do take a look at the information on the website and uh, sign up and join. It would be wonderful if you could make it. So tonight's presentation, as uh, you all know, is about the modeling uh, diseases with R. And we have our two speakers, uh, Federica from Rome and Jacqueline from New York. And uh, they will be taking us on a journey through both deterministic and Bayes and Sir model methods and providing us with some fascinating insight into this field. Um, at the heart of uh, the discussion is the well known Sir model, which helps to understand how an epidemic might unfold and what measures can be taken to prevent its spread. So whether you are a student of science, a healthcare professional, or simply someone who wants to understand more, like me, about how to use the R for modeling diseases, this is gonna be a very exciting and interesting um, talk for your presentation. Um, so we'll begin with a quick introduction of the SIR model with uh, Federica. And then Jacqueline will take us through the, the Bayesian workflow for disease transmission. And at the end of the event, we will be hosting a Q&A session. So please put your uh, questions into the, the chat and we'll be answering those questions for you. So without further ado, I will pass you on to Federica. Hello, everyone. So thank you very much for coming tonight, today, this afternoon. So I'm very happy to have you all here. I uh, hope you enjoy this, uh, this event, which is uh, in partnership with uh, Our Ladies New York. Thank you very much, Dorota. Uh, you, you need to, so let's say that Rome has taken this first little initial part of the meeting, and then the rest will be in New York, okay? So thank you very much. So I start sharing my screen. Um, sorry if I do not take any uh, questions. If you like to ask more things, you can put everything in the chat so we can uh, answer your question um, as soon as possible. And then I'll do a very little intro about the SIR model. So the um, for, for modern infectious diseases in a deterministic way. Uh, to introduce uh, Jacqueline, 
uh, uh, and, and, and she will uh, bring us into a more deeper discussion about this uh, uh, type of modeling. So I'll share my screen. So this is um, uh, all the material that we need is a tidy wax um, uh, meta package and the dissolve package. So you can, if you um, do not have the packages, you might need to install them with this using this function install dot packages. And then you might want to do this way as I've shown you but uh, or otherwise uh, uh, package by package. More information as I put in the chat, you can find it in this uh, GitHub repo where there's this presentation and a couple of scripts uh, to let you uh, get started. Otherwise, if you do not, might happen if you do not have R or R uh, Studio installed, you can use posit.cloud uh, and you will be uh able to start immediately uh with an R script and follow along so what's happened here is in this presentation we will explore how to implement uh the deterministic SIR model in r including how to simulate the model plot the result and interpret the output we will also discuss about the assumptions and the limitation of the model and how to extend it into a more complex scenarios. Uh, so let's dive in and learn a bit more about this deterministic SIR model in R. What is a SIR model? Okay, so we haven't seen, uh, you haven't said that again uh, yet. Um, a SIR model is a mathematical model which is used to describe the spread of infectious diseases in a population. Um, the model, uh, as you can see by its name, uh, divides the population into three compartments, the susceptible, the infected, and the recovered. And uh, this is uh, because it's, its name are its seer. So the susceptible, the infected, and the recovered. So the deterministic version of the SIR model assumes that the transmission rate, this is the first important parameter, and the recovery rate are constant over time. And the population is homogeneous. So this is a very educational uh, view of the, the SIR model that will let you uh, be um, um, able to uh, dive in into a more um, uh, uh, specific uh, way. Here in this little um, uh, in this little gift, you can see how an, uh, an infection uh, and uh, ca can uh, um, change uh, the distribution of the infected, which is the, this bluish line. Uh, sorry, the, uh, this red uh, curve. Uh, and so the susceptible start decreasing because they get infected and then within, with the green line, they recover. Uh, let's, let's see what's happened. So basically, mathematically, uh, just to, to give you a little uh, um, uh, overview, uh, what's happened is this. So as I said, we have susceptibles, infected and recovered. So we start from a population, let's say a thousand people. Okay, one gets infected. What's happened to all the all the others? So they are the susceptibles, and um, uh, uh, so a proportion uh, n is the population. Uh, a proportion of the population will, uh, which is uh, susceptible, will get infected. And then those that are infected, a proportion of those that are infected will recover. So this is basically what's happened. And how do we, how, how we are able to um, identify these changes within this proportion of the population? Uh, basically identifying 
the parameters. This is the first step. And so we establish what is the population. And we might want to take a sample of the entire population. Uh, what is the susceptibles? What are the infected? And then we aim to eventually estimate the amount of recovery. So we have these two parameters, as I said, the transmission rate, which is beta, and the very important uh, parameters, and the recovery rate, which is gamma. They are both expressed in days power minus one. So that means that if you, for example, um, recover within 10 days, one divided by 10, so 0.1, is the uh, recovery rate. Very simple. Uh, and so up to here, it's all good. Now, what do we do? So basically, to estimate these values, we use um, differential equations. What are differential equations? So they, we know, uh, we assume that we know what, are, what is a simple equation, okay? So a differential equation is uh, an equation that is put to two um, uh, elements which are uh, supposed to be equal, uh, changing within a length of time, okay? So we have the susceptibles with changing, within um, uh, a time frame, okay? Let's say 10 days, 100 days, 15 days, okay? So this uh, difference this, the, can be estimated with the transmission rate and the proportion of the infected on the population. So we, are, we assume that uh, the susceptible the number of susceptible decreases within time because the infected gets growing, the, the, the amount of infected. And so the infected, how they change within time, they change it by decreasing in number based on the recovery rate. More they recover, more they decrease in number. And then finally, the recover, the recovered uh, part of the population, it's um, considered to be equal as the uh, recovery rate times the infected. So now, I, I, I assume that you have some, some background knowledge and we are going to put these three equations inside our, an R function and then we calculate them, okay? And then we plot it. So let's see what's happened. So what we have done so far is to define the parameters. So we have a population of 1,000, for example. We have a beta, which is a transmission rate, let's say two days. So one divided by two is 0 0.5. And let's say we have a recovery rate of 10 days. So one divided by 10 is 0 0.1. And this is basically the translation of uh, our mathematical notations into R. So what we do is putting this equation, our beta, uh, the susceptible, the infected divided by n, so the proportion of infected in the population, and so on and so forth. If you uh, basically have any question, put it in the chat and I'll, I will answer them later. So, so we have susceptible, infected, and recovered, and still they're not working. So if I put them in R like this, they um, are not very useful, okay? So to, to work on this model within R, I need to um, set those uh, parameter definitions in a way that they are all, for example, um, in a vector. So I start saying I have a thousand, of a, as a population, but one is infected. So the susceptible are 999. I can set this initial state as a susceptible infected equals to one and recover the seal. We don't have recovery. Then we set the parameter vectors, parameters vector. 
uh, the beta, the gamma, and then we say that the population will be equal to the sum of this initial state. Okay, so let's see what's happened next. So now we need a function. Okay, uh, just a, um, briefly a, a disclaimer. Okay, there's many packages in R, uh, even because of COVID and spread of the outbreaks and everything. So they have uh, uh, basically, you can find the world uh, of information uh, function already made. You just, you do SEER and it calculates everything. But what's happening re effectively? So let's, let's dive in these functions, uh, this type of functions and see what's happened. Basically, I set up a function uh, of three parameters, time, state, and parameters. The state is the state of the population that changes from, from susceptible to infected and to recovered. And uh, I set up a list inside this function. What I do is I set up a list of the state and the parameters and then put this uh, uh, three differential equations and ask to return all of them as a list. We will jump into R um, in a couple of uh, minutes. Uh, and so we see how it looks like. Um, then one more important parameter, because time is a parameter, uh, is its time. So we are looking at um, the spread of an infection, but in what length of time? So let's imagine that we select 100 days and they are um, specified by um, a fraction of, 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 the, of days. And then, uh, what's happened is that with this function, the order function, this is from the dissolve package. So the package that I've shown you on the very first slide. And this one is able, this function here is able to uh, solve the differential, this, those three differential equations, releasing a number there will be approximately what, what, what it should be if the uh, beta and gamma are what, they have, what we have provided. Okay, so inside this other function, you put the initial state, which is uh, this one here, the initial state, then uh, the, the time, the function and, and the parameters. Okay, so this is the very basic start of the thing. Uh, obviously, there's many possibility you can add, change parameters, situation, vaccinations, uh, further uh, infections, uh, uh, intervention by the governments, uh, and, and everything. So, this SIR model can be. Uh, um, um, adjusted um, as needed. Okay, so I'll um, stop sharing for, for a second uh, for to jump into R. I want to look um, at the chat if there's any um, important question to, to, um, to answer. Okay. Let's have a look at, I'll start from, from the bottom and then I go up, back up. Uh, what does the transmission rate of 0.5 mean in English term? And as uh, an example, will be useful for those who don't have enough domain knowledge. Yes, uh, yes. As I said, uh, for example, the transmission rate, uh, it's uh, as a unit, is expressed in days powered at minus one, so one divided by days. And this means that um, if uh, you get the transmission 
um, happens within two days, one divided by two is 0 0.5. So this is the meaning. I hope I have answered the question. Um, are there any other questions uh, maybe uh, that I haven't seen? Oh, I don't think so. I think okay. that was the only one so far. All right. Okay, I'll, I'll share my R. And then uh, we do, I don't think we, we have much. Uh, uh, we don't, don't spend very, very long time on this uh, more. Just to show you, um, there you go. Okay, so this is the, um, uh, where is it? Uh, this is the uh, SIR model with R GitHub repo uh, that you have uh, um, as, a, as a material. So what we are going to do is uh, just for you to, uh, to see what's happened here. If I, uh, so I'm inside a project, I add a new file, I can do a script, from this uh, uh, toggle here. And um, let's say I call it model two, just to have another another one here. And it automatically uh, put it inside the location where I, uh, I am, uh, where I am. So stay forward, easy to, to do. Then what's happened uh, is that uh, I like to basically um, show you some some uh, um, things that just to um, how can I say uh, we can take like the, the the very start of the thing uh, like the initial state um, here. So as we said. Uh, we need to uh, set an initial state uh, and then the parameters. And then what we want to do is to make a function. Okay. We call this function uh, seed model. Uh, inside the function, we have a time, uh, we have a state, and we have parameters. Inside this, uh, we need to width uh, as a list. And then we have uh, inside this, uh, this list, the uh, two important parameter, parameters, the state and the parameters. Okay. Uh, this is not uh, all, okay. Because what, what we need is basically um, adding more information. Like we need to uh, add inside this with uh, this list uh, our uh, differential equation. Let, let's take them from here. Okay. Uh, and then we put it here. So we have uh, um, the susceptibles, the infected, and the uh, recovered. Okay, so now what we want is to return uh, a list. And uh, this would be a list. And this is very important part. Because uh, when you add or change this, this uh, differential equation, because you can add more or uh, this return, this list must be uh, completed. So you need to add all the uh, parameters that you use. And so this should work. And let's have a look at this function. So if I do that, I can see that I've made a function and it is what it is. Okay. 
So I have this uh, established these initial values, but uh, I haven't uh, said anything about the time. Okay, let's go back here and say that I want uh, have a look at this model. I put it here uh, from uh, with a sequence. Okay, with a sequence from zero to one by no point one. Okay, it, what what this means? It that I have a sequence from zero to hundred by breaking down by number one. Okay, so uh, that, uh, now uh, we start diving into what is the dissolve package. Let's add this to. Um, libraries because we use this for making a plot um and so we use this order uh we can we can do differently so we can use this the solve and then double colon and then order yeah and then with a question mark we can see what this function is does it's uh, so it's a general solver for ordinary differential equations and uh, as you can see, uh, there's uh, some methods that can, different methods that can be used. Uh, we, we do very, very, the very, the very introduction of this function. Um, and so you can have a look at the uh, documentation here, uh, and it's very informative as well as um, um, some uh, other resources that you can find within the, the package documentation, the vignette. So let's take uh, more um, things from, from here. So we save time. Uh, what we put inside the function is this. Okay, we, we use the initial state, the times the SIR model function that we have just made and the parameters. So this is what uh, uh, what's happened basically. If I run this function, uh, what uh, is released? Uh, it's um, the calculate the result of the calculation of our differential equation. So I, I have a vector of time. Uh, the susceptibles. And this is the proportion of the susceptible that, for example, decreases within time. Uh, the infected, which is increasing, and the recovered, which is uh, as well increasing. Okay, just this started from a thousand of nine nine nine, and this starts from zero, and then both uh change it uh based on the number of infect uh, infections okay so now uh we need to put them uh, inside a data frame there, there are different uh, ways to do to do this okay this is one but it's not the only one you can use tidyverse for example so this is a classic way to do the things so I put them inside the data frame. So uh, it's almost the same, but now, because if I ever look at this seed out class, uh, um, I used to do that. It's my grip, uh, uh, it's deep layer, but I used to do that. With it. So as you can see, it's a class dissolve or matrix. So it is not a data frame. Uh, basically, what I'm uh, I'm doing here is transforming my information uh, uh, as to be as a data frame. In fact, if I ever look at this, this is a data frame, and now I can use it to plot it. Uh, but before that as I, I want to do a certain type of plot, I need to reshape it. 
So there is a package which I um, didn't uh, mention. Um, I call it this Sir Long, uh, and it's called Reshape. Uh, reshape 2, okay. Uh, it's a nice package which provides a function which is melt. It's about you can even use people longer, okay. And uh, now with the new tidyverse uh, set, uh, it's even easier. Uh, so we what we put inside is our uh, uh, seal data frame. And we want to ED bars because if I do tab, I can see that it's not mentioned what other option I can use inside the melt. Can even have a, a, a quick look. It's convert an object into a, a molten data frame. Uh, and I use ID bars equal to time. It's not times, but time, okay? So when I run this, the result uh, of this is that I have uh, a new object uh, and basically reshaped my data frame to have a variable vector with the susceptible infected and recovered and the values. And then the vector of time, which is not times as I was before. Okay, now we can make a, a nice ggplot visualization and have uh, uh, as a data uh, this still um, long, which appears here. Then we mapping uh, the aesthetic. Uh, and in the aesthetic, we uh, we want in the x-axis, the time in the y-axis, the value, okay? And then uh, a geom line, okay? Um, let's have a look at what it does. Oh, okay, that's nice. So we have a like uh, a couple of minutes to uh, refresh. <laughs> Sorry about that. I stop sharing. Okay, right. I haven't seen if there's any questions in the chat. They have been removed. Okay, mm, it's a shame. Um, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's correct. So, uh, let's, um, see what's happening here. I share back my screen. Okay, can you all see it? Yep. Back and see. And here we go. Yes, yeah. Okay. So this might uh, appear a bit like uh, not exactly uh, what it should be. So we might want to add the color as a variable. Uh, we, okay. Oh, now, now it looks like something that we are <laughs> a bit more <laughs> uh, like familiar. Okay, so this is it basically so then we can play with the plot like with lines and everything um i'd like to finish here uh the the only things that um i like to i uh, show you it's one more thing which is this 
this is a nice package. It's uh, called the shiny sieve, for example, just to mention one of the thousands uh, resources. Uh, what's happen if um, it, it provides a, um, a little shiny app? Uh, this runs shiny. Uh, that if I if I run this um, this app, you can see that you have uh, uh, a sim model, and uh, below there is a, the, the the plot, and you can uh, play with it like increasing the infectious period and these changes. Oh, this I, I haven't mm, talked too much <laughs> at all about this. Um, uh, R node, which is a very important part, but you know, uh, you, if you are interested, you you find more information. You get in touch, and um, uh, maybe we can uh, um, like uh, improve our knowledge about this uh, sim model. So I stop sharing, and um, this is all I have. Thank you so much, Federica. Um, I actually had a question. Are the values that are um, like S, I, R, and for example, the transmission rate, those would all be based on real world information? Uh, okay, this is the deterministic model. That means, uh, so for, uh, it's, it's a more uh, educational, uh, educational level and uh, you might want to use it to look back at infections and to study them and see how they have developed within time. Uh, and it assumes that uh, there is a, uh, a, a certain amount of the population, which is, um, you know, you sample the, your population and they are not fixed, but they vary uh, within the rates, which is, are the determinants that you establish so the, the, the difference within a stochastic model or Bayesian model is that the uh, rates, the uh, transmission and recovery rate in this case are uh, set um, uh, at the very beginning. So you, you start with those, those values and then um, have a look at how, how it goes, how it changes, and then you adjust. Basically. Thank you. And then we have another uh, raised hand. Yeah. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so yeah, my name is Aru. Um, I have a question uh, which is partly uh, outside the scope, but I would like you to at least uh, try to address it, which is that typically in infectious diseases, what happens is that R number is interesting to model what is much more important is the K number, like the dis dispersion parameter, because you know that's where kind of the super spreading typically comes from. And as we saw, particularly during COVID, R-based models are nice to play around with when you have a lot of time lockdowns at home. It doesn't really show how the disease actually progresses in the real world. Uh, I, I realize that's a separate talk topic, but I would love you if you can like just talk a little bit about how you model kind of the heterogeneity of transmission and if you have any resources around that. Uh, thank you, thank you for, for this uh, uh, question. And yes, uh, basically you uh, uh, have, uh, what I presented here is a very little introduction of a deterministic model just to, um, as a kickstart, let's say. Uh, when when you go a bit more in deep on, uh, on this type of models, uh, you might know better than me. Uh, you need to consider other factors, other environmental factors, such as uh, how the susceptible can um, uh, are relating with the infect uh, with the infected, how they can get infected, how they cannot get infected. It's all a matter of uh, even uh, policies, uh, government policies to prevent uh, and contain uh, the spread of the infections. And then you monitor it basically based on uh, the increase of infections or the, the, or the number of recovered. Um, and you then, uh, it, it depends by the type of uh, um, uh, infectious diseases you are dealing with. 
but uh, you might want to consider uh, how long the length of time for recovering and uh, how it varies if you get in, um, immunization uh, um, after uh, 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 having um, been infected from someone, how many people is, um, get infected from one, this is this DR uh, value, the DR node that it, it's very important. So basically DR node is the number of people that are get infected by one. Uh, so one in, uh, single in, um, uh, people which is infected, how much power uh, has inside itself to spread this infection? It can infect it two people, three people, just one. Uh, so uh, this is the, it's, it's even a, uh, another very important uh, step to, to, uh, to look at when you deal with this type of uh, um, uh, diseases. So this type of modelings and infections. Uh, I don't know if I entirely answered the question. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, I think we are ready to pass it off to our second speaker. Uh, Jackie, are you there? Let's see, there she is. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, so thank you for such a great introduction. This was awesome to really um, get a good um, sort of context for the um, the work that I'm going to show here. So give me a moment. I'm going to set up my slides, and I'm waiting for my video to start up. I don't know. My computer's been really slow today, so I think if it helps, you can go off video. That recognizes it that it's Saturday. <laughs> yep. Um, it also looks like I'm not able to screen share at the moment, so I think a host needs to allow me to do that. Federica, are you able to give her those permissions? I think you uh, you 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 can you should do the, uh, that uh, be able to do that as well because you are a co-host. Well, oh no, yeah. I'm, I don't think Jackie is a co-host. Okay, I'll make you our host. There you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no worries. Thank you. Yep, now I see. Okay. Just loading up. All right, so let me know if you're able to see the screen. Um, I see uh, started screen sharing, but still not, you cannot see. Okay, so I oh, think no, this no, is I the see. function of the very slow startup. So it's gonna force me to work through this kind of slowly. I would say if, um, I'm moving too fast. Please inter interrupt me. Um, this is uh, sort of a crash course in Bayesian analysis. So um, uh, I'm happy to step back and take it slower one step at a time. So um, as an introduction about me, so I don't work in infectious disease modeling. Um, I typically analyze clinical trial data from, onco from oncology data sets for my day job. Um, in past lives, I've worked in various analytical roles, all with a Bayesian bent and all in the sort of biostatistics area of bioinformatics. Um, but I've always been interested in different modeling approaches. And I really believe that there's a lot of value in cross-pollinating across disciplines and learning from other modeling approaches. So particularly during the pandemic, and even beforehand, this is an area of modeling I've been really interested in. And the um, structure of this particular SIR model is actually very similar to PKPD modeling work that I do in my day job and other, there are other approaches that, 
that utilize this ODE framework. So um, that's a little bit about me. Um, also, I love sailing and these are IODs, which is a boat I used to race on. And so um, a little bit of context for the ODEs, not to be confused with ODEs. Um, so as um, Federica introduced, the SIR model is a pretty standard three compartment ODE model. Um, patients transition from different states according to these transition rates. And um, the rates that it generally starts with are the susceptible infected and recovered populations. So um, before moving into uh, using this as a basis for analysis, I just wanna pause and think about the implications of this structure. So the first thing is that this assumes that the recovered is a terminal state. After a patient's recovered, they can no longer enter the susceptible population. There's no risk of reinfection. So right off the bat, I'm thinking about how this sort of basic model is gonna be inconsistent with our current state of knowledge regarding COVID-19 and actually the majority of infections. A case where, and, and, and similarly, I'm thinking about what are cases where this type of model would be expected to hold. And um, the second piece here is that we're sort of assuming that uh, all infected people are equally infectious, right? There's a homogeneity to this, um, that the rates don't change over time and that they apply similarly sort of at an average across the population and that's sufficient to describe the dynamics in the population. Um, uh, nonetheless, this is a really good starting point to build additional models on. So we wanna start with a basic model, we wanna test it, and then we wanna expand it sort of judiciously to capture the pieces that are most important for the question we're trying to answer. So this is a very typical scenario in Bayesian modeling where you start with a very sort of well-established base model, and then we add on different layers to it over time. Um, so this model is described by the same um, differential equations that Federica presented, uh, which is great because I don't have to introduce them again. Um, but as a reminder, we have this sort of proportion of infected per persons. We have the beta, which is how infectious the disease is. And we have the gamma, the rate of recovery uh, among infected persons. And um, this also assumes that the total population size is fixed. So we don't have people, there's no mortality in this model, for example. Uh, we also have no new births. There's no, the population size does not change over time. And again, this recovered state is terminal and that the dynamics uh, only depend on the beta and the gamma. So this is why we typically use this R0 um, to describe the population dynamics, but in more complicated models, this is not sufficient to really think about. The initial state is not the important one. The equilibrium state is the important one. Um, an example of a disease where this model might hold well is something like measles, like standard things that we can vaccinate against very well now, because they once you're infected, you tend to be immune. You tend not to get reinfected. Um, the population at risk is generally pretty stable. And so this, it's just useful to think about that most of these cases are things that we've already addressed through vaccines. If, if there's a case of, of um, durable immunity, then we probably don't need to model it as aggressively, except in, in pandemics like the one we see here. Um, so in this uh, example, in this context, I'm gonna use um, some software called STAN uh, to, it's a language, um, to simulate data, and then we're gonna fit the model to that simulated data. And so if you're following along, and I will be posting the slides here, but uh, because my computer is like not pushing very quickly, it hasn't been posted exactly yet. Um, but the way that I'm gonna fit this is using a, a library called Command Stan R. Command Stan R is a shell, it sort of calls out to command stand on your command line and it provides a, 
a very um, simple, lightweight interface to the scan. Um, so in one thing I'm, I want to say here is that Bayesian modeling, if you have no context and no familiarity with it, I'm not going to give you a full introduction at this point. If the material I'm showing here is interesting to you, there are lots of resources to learn about Bayesian modeling and to apply it and to start with the basics of kind of what is Bayesian modeling. I am not going to go into that because I think we're not going to get to the end of this talk if I do that. And a quick introduction I'm not convinced would do you a lot of value. Um, and similarly, I, I'm going to show you stand code and I will describe it, but the detailed syntax I think is really beyond the context of this talk. So I'm happy to answer questions, but I would say that if um, treat this as a motivational example. If it's interesting, it might motivate you to learn more. And um, the logic of how this works may be, may be helpful. So it, what we're going to do here is define a function in STAN to sample from the SIR model itself. This is going to be a model for the sort of population dynamics. And very similar to the DE solve that Federica showed, we're going to define um, this model takes in a vector of um, or a uh, it's actually the um, the time, the observed state, the parameters, and then um, arrays of real and integer values um, that are going to be inputs to the model. And then we're going to return back the differential equations that have been defined before. Um, so this code is very similar to the DE solve code that we showed before. It's just written in the stand language. It's going to be compiled and uh, transpiled to C++ and then exposed to R so we can work with it. Um, we are uh, we're going to write a very minimal stand file and expose it to R so that we can sample from it. And there's a function in R stand called expose stand functions that kind of does this gymnastics for us. And once we run this, we can call our SIR model and this code to simulate from the SIR model as if it's a standard R function. So this allows us to kind of, it's very useful for testing the stand code but it's also very useful just for simulating data in a way that's consistent with how the model will be fit. Um, so I wanted to spend a moment here first to talk about the simulate sir function, and then we'll simulate some data using it. So here I'm going to pass in a vector of times, an array of times, uh, an initial population size, uh, an initial number of infected cases, and then our, our values for beta and gamma. And from this, I am gonna call the, um, the stand version of the DE solve function, integrate this ODE, and then return uh, this vector. It's gonna be an array of size three with the S, I, and R components. Uh, for each time point. So, and this is an example of calling this to simulate some data. So first I'm creating the vector of times. Here we're stepping to time 25. Um, I'm gonna assume an initial population size of a thousand. Uh, the first one infected index case, uh, a beta of four and a gamma of 0.25. And so this would assume a sort of average duration of infection of approximately four days. Um, and then this is some tidyverse code that's going to transform this into a friendly data frame for me to work with. Um, and given this data frame, uh, I have, um, I'm going to plot the simulation down here. And Unfortunately, this is a little bit. Uh, so the I are our number of infections. Uh, this is the sort of true underlying population dynamics. And then we have our susceptible and recovered rates um, that are our function, you know, the same SIR model that we've seen before. So this should look very familiar to us. Um, the piece that we're going to now layer on is the likelihood. So this is kind of our prior expectation. This describes the model for the population that we expect to see. It does not describe the data that we've collected. 
So the second part in the Bayesian inference is to infer the parameter values given data. And in order to do that, we have to think about what kind of data we expect to see. Um, the most typical case are going to be the number of case counts over time. But if we have something else like the number of recovered or we have something about number of test detections, then we want to model the data we see. And that's, that's actually uh, very important. So here we're going to simulate data using a negative binomial um, distribution. And this is a parameterization that's based on a population mean and then a dispersion parameter phi. And um, one thing I would say here is that we can, we can vary this simulation. It's actually very useful to simulate under different scenarios and see what values, what the data would look like for different values of phi. Um, uh, so here I'm gonna use the simulate cases. Oh, the other piece here is we're gonna add this function to our stand code and then again, run this exposed stand functions um, method so that we can simulate data according to this model. And in red here, oh, the other piece is that although I've plotted the um, underlying state and it sort of on very small time steps, I'm assuming we only have data on a per day basis. So my, my time point for the case measurements is um, every day instead of uh, 0 0.1 every sort of fraction of a day. But otherwise, I've kept these variables the same. And here, I'm using a pretty high value of p. Um, so in red are the simulated case counts according to this model. And um, this is the, um, the data we're going to use to sort of test our inference. We're going to check that we can recover the true values we use to simulate the data um, from the stand code when we write it. So the first step in order to test this and actually run inference is to take the functions that we wrote and integrate them into the model itself. So the first section of the stand code is actually the same functions block we were working with before. And now we've added on information about the model we wanna estimate. Um, so the data block describes the data that would be provided to the stand program in order to estimate the model. And here I, I'm giving very minimal amount of information. There's uh, the number of time points, the actual time point um, values, uh, the number of cases at each time point, and then um, providing the initial population size and the initial number of index cases as data. Um, in practice, we rarely know what the true population size is, and we rarely know the initial number of index cases. But we can assume there was some index case, but we don't know um, the time at which that was observed. So here, um, providing them as data just to sort of simplify the test case, we actually know these in the case of simulated data, but typically these would end up being parameters we would wanna estimate in a real world scenario. So in this model, we have only two parameters, um, beta and gamma for this um, prior, and we have the uh, fee that is gonna be used for the measurement model. Uh, here, I'm gonna first, in the transformed parameters block, um, give the estimate of our underlying population dynamics as a precursor to the actual data model that we expect to see. And then uh, the number of cases that are observed are only based on the uh, number of in the infectious part of that, the second component of our um, ODE system. So taken together, these parts, once we um, compile this model, this allows us to run, um, do inference on observed data and try to infer the posterior values of beta and gamma and phi, given the data we've observed. Um, at the bottom here, I'm adding in some generated quantities, which are um, post sort of other ancillary quantities that we want stand to compute for us, but they're not related to inference. They're often things like predictions, or uh, you might want to put R naught in here, the, the um, ratio of the beta to gamma. But 
uh, here I'm putting in just some things to help with model diagnostics. And in the bottom block here, I am going to actually run the stand code. So first we're, we're adding in, this is the data block, which is going to match the inputs of these. Uh, and then we, we call the sampling on the data and I'm actually saving it so that it can be reused later. Um, so this model is pretty, we don't have a lot of data. It takes only a few minutes to sample um, and it seems to work pretty well. Uh, the next task here is to uh, summarize the inferences. And here I tend to use a package called tidy bays to summarize the inferences very flexibly. And I'm not including the code in this particular slide just because I think it would over, like it's actually a little bit long. But the nice thing about tidy bays is it allows us to access each of these parameters and values and sort of in, in a very flexible way summarize them. So here I'm plotting the posterior inference for these, um, the Ys uh, after seeing the data. So a cool part of this is that given new data, we can now infer what the likely value of R0 is or the likely um, uh, range of values for beta and gamma and how we expect this pandemic to unfold. And um, this kind of thing, we often will test it on truncated data so we can see um, given only five days of measurements, how reliably can we predict uh, what the what the trajectory will do, what the curve will do. Um, and this really combines the substantive knowledge about the disease area, this SSIR model um, component with the measurement model for the data we've seen on the number of cases. Um, the next thing we wanna do is actually test how well we're able to recover the true values that we use to simulate the data, because this is a data test. And the first part of this uh, I'm looking at are the betas and gammas. So the beta we used was four, which is quite a high number for beta. And the posterior estimates here are at least consistent with that. Um, this is the posterior median. These are the 50s and 80s. And then this is the density. Uh, gamma is a lot better estimated. And here's our posterior estimate of phi. So this is a helpful exercise because when we go to fit, say, real data, and we see that um, the values come back and they either make a lot of sense or don't make any sense, at least we know the model is functioning well on simulated data where the data matches the generating process that we assume given the model. Um, so one thing I wanna do now is actually just pause and see if there are any questions so far, or if there are components that would be helpful for me to um, step through or dig into in more detail. Okay. I'm going to assume there are no questions now. Yeah, Instead, um, I'll um, move on I, to this example given uh, looking at data from a, a flu outbreak. So this is a very sort of standard data set that's used for yeah, testing and demonstrating SIR models. Mm -hmm. Yep. There is a question in the chat. Were you able to see it? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure we didn't miss that. I think the person who posted the question has their hand raised right now. Ah. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. They they unmuted so a huge, me anyway, but the question is the same. Problem with epidemic prediction.
Yeah. Let's see. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So one of the um, nice things about using a Bayesian model is that we have a lot of flexibility in how the model, how the parameters are estimated. So in the case of the pandemic, um, and I have an example of this uh, in the second, in the third section of the talk, um, the most common scenario is to model uh, where the beta and the gamma change over time. So, and they change according to covariates. So for example, um, there's a nice analysis where the um, people, the analysts use uh, mobility data in aggregate from cell phone usage in each region to show how the beta varies and the R naught varies over time and correlates strongly with the mobility data. So we can see the impact of uh, behaviors on the pandemic um, dynamics. We can test this retrospectively. There are similar analyses that look at how the, um, uh, the infectiveness uh, changes according to the strain of COVID, for example, or according to the season or according to policies. And um, so this, I actually have here an example where they showed how the model, this a basic model doesn't work very well until we include a change of policy. And if we look at the improving the model, they incorporate under reporting, and then they actually incorporate control measures and only after they include these two components can we fit the data well. So that there are sort of two parts um, that are very useful to this modeling approach is that one, when the data and the model really don't fit well, um, you tend to have sampling problems. You tend to see problems in prediction. Um, you tend to see problems where the data doesn't match the expectations of the model very well. I'm trying to get down to the part where they show now they've recovered this fit. And the reason it works is because the R naught changed over time. And once they allow that change over time to be modeled, now they're able to at least model the, the historical dynamics. Well, we, we've learned something about both the impact of these, these measures and about the sort of the base model is too simplistic to match the dynamics that we see in practice. So it's like a really fundamental starting point. And then there's a lot of flexibility in how you expand it. And it's a little bit of an art and science to say, this data doesn't fit well. What do I think is missing? And then add that component onto the model. The second point I would make here is that um, checking the model against simulated data with every change is also very helpful because as you're adding, as the model gets more and more complex, uh, it's harder to reason about uh, when it's working and when it's not working and to make sure that it's not working because of the data mismatch and not that you're having a failure of working because of some error, or some bug in your model code. So that's one of the reasons why I, I like this framework of using the exposed stand functions where I can simulate data using exactly the same code that my model's using and then fit it and, and sort of iteratively keep testing it in this way. So um, one reason I brought up this flu outbreak is that it's a case where um, the data and the model are not too far off. So the, there was, um, this is a case where at a boarding school way back in 1978, when these models were very sort of cutting edge, um, uh, there was an, a pretty virulent outbreak at a boarding school and uh, there was a report of the data in a statistical journal. And many years later, people have digitized this data and used it as a canonical example for this kind of model. We don't know a lot of details because it's really only what was reported in this case report. Um, but it's an interesting example. Um, so this is the description. The data are available. There's an R package called outbreaks that you can, you can query. 
And there are two fields that are reported. There's the number of subjects in bed over time. And a majority of the students of seven, not a majority, but approximately, you know, a, a good fraction of the students became ill and were taken out of, out of class. Um, and then the convalescent patients were sent sort of home to recover and rest after being in bed. Um, so uh, one thing I wanna do here is, is use this as an example and fit it to our, our model. So I'm gonna prepare the data in much the same way as was done previously. Uh, we have the total population size. I'm gonna treat the initial date as the minimum date reported here, which is mid in mid January, January 22nd. Um, but we actually know that the first infection happened on the 10th. So there's some sort of latent delay in the time of infection versus when a student is actually in bed. And we already know that there's some likely discrepancy between when someone's infectious and when they're in bed. Because once they're in bed, they're probably not as exposed or exposing their, their colleagues. But nonetheless, um, this is a useful starting point for this model. Um, here, I'm preparing these data and passing them into the same STAN uh, basic SIR model that we used before. And when we uh, prepare the posterior draws and, and compare them to the case count, we find that they fit the data pretty well. So here is our estimate for the number of susceptible individuals. Um, the number of infected matches our observed data pretty well. There's a couple of discrepancies here. Is um, no longer infectious and no longer susceptible. Um, the second thing we wanna look at is a comparison of the predicted counts versus our observed counts. Uh, we wanna see that um, the, the model for the measurement is fitting the data pretty well. And we do see here, there's an, there's, um, an extra frequency of high counts than the model would expect. And that probably corresponds to this second hump in our disease um, counts. But generally this data fits pretty well. I think there's room to improve the model, but it, um, it's, it's again, it's a good starting point. Um, given this, we can estimate the recovery time, the average recovery time given the one over uh, the inverse of gamma. And four days is about right for both our knowledge of flu and for what was reported anecdotally in this case report. So our, um, we know that most students stayed in bed for three to four days, according to this. The R0 estimate here is quite high. It's much higher than is typical for flu. And that's consistent with the fact that uh, later they determined that um, it was very likely H1N1 and not a standard flu. Uh, we do have a fair amount of measurement noise. And that um, is not, not surprising, but it's 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 within the range of what we would expect. Um, and then the beta and gammas are not too far away from our priors and from what we would expect to see. So um, as I mentioned, this is really um, a starting point. Um, it's really a foundation. And in practice, if you are interested in different approaches, it's it's um, fascinating to see all the different ways that people apply these to pandemics like COVID. And just some examples that are out in the literature include spatial models where, say, New Jersey and New York City can co-infect each other um, differently depending on their commuter um, frequency. And there, it's, a two, it, it, it's essentially two versions of a SIR model where um, the um, the compartments in New York City can infect New Jersey and the compartments in New Jersey can infect New York City. And so that's a, one example. Um, there are a lot more uh, spatial ways to approach this spatial distribution of disease, whether it's from an adjacency matrix or other components. Um, and then the second 
piece that's kind of interesting and relevant to COVID-19 is to add other compartments. So here I'm gonna show uh, an example from a really nice paper published fairly recently where they described a model that they found fit the data pretty well. And here they have compartments for the number of susceptible subjects um, who can then become exposed. And uh, after some period of time, they become infectious. So here we're separating the time of exposure from the infectious period um, and further separating that from when it's detected with a test because we know in COVID often patients are most infectious before they're symptomatic. Um, and then similarly, we have models for um, the recovery uh, and hospitalization or uh, death. This is the uh, model where they included the mobility data. And these are the, uh, oh, the other important piece of this is that the parameters uh, about the transmission rates can vary over time and can vary according to covariates. So, um, and this, this model was fit using STAN. Um, you can see the STAN code, you can test it yourself. And it's a really nice example of sort of iteratively um, building up a STAN model in order to recover the, the dynamics that we care most about. Um, in this case, we also have data for the test rate, the number of subjects who were detected and known to be infect infectious, the hospitalization rates, and then, of course, the mortality counts. And each of these are modeled using similar negative binomial model. Um, so this is one example among many. There are um, it's sort of fascinating to see all the different ways that people are approaching uh, this kind of modeling for COVID-19. Um, and particularly because there were so many different groups working in parallel, it's a great example of uh, how, how different people would address the same problem to answer different questions. Um, so in this case, they included as a covariate this degree of mobility from aggregate cell phone tracking for different states. And this shows in purple the completely home times for each state. The R, sort of this reproductive rate, was much lower than when uh, people were in full time work or when restaurant visits were very frequent. So both of these. Um, do increase this infection rate, and they do so differently depending on the state. So not every state had the same degree of benefit from these different measures and had the same degree of variability depending on the degree of mobility. So that's also kind of interesting. Um, it's one way to get at this question of how different policies can impact a pandemic. Um, Coming back to the kind of work that I typically do in PKPD modeling, uh, we're actually modeling how a drug moves through different compartments in the body. So if you get an infusion, the drug first gets into your bloodstream and then it, it permeates your different tissues and it's eventually um, uh, processed and, and taken out either by the liver or the kidney. And so that's actually where the, the, the sort of dynamics, the, the um, pharmacology of that, uh, the chemistry is, is the type of modeling, but it's a very similar approach of trying to model how a drug perfuses through different compartments in the body um, and can do so differently depending on different states of the body. Um, so that is, uh, I have an acknowledgement slide, but I think it's not showing up here. So that's that's the material that I've prepared for today. Um, as I mentioned, I am going to post all the code on uh, my GitHub. And I do want to acknowledge um, two sources that I use pretty heavily in preparing this. The first is this paper, um, which motivated a lot of the examples. And then the second is um, this, sorry, this, um, 
uh, I can't get to the, but there's a, a case study on the SPAN website that I think is very helpful um, and also walks through the SPAN code is a good example. Um, so with that, I'll um, pause. I see there are a number of questions in the chat and so I'll, I'll start to go through them. Uh, thank you for sharing the case study link. That was really helpful. Uh, so there's a question regarding the packages that I use. And for that, let me pull up my RStudio window. I can show you. Um, so the first is the tidyverse um, generally. So this primarily includes per tidyr, dplyr, and ggplot. Um, the second is tidybase. And this uh, allows me to pull and format very flexibly the parameters from a posterior fit of the model or a prior fit to the model. Um, and this, so there are sort of two parts to tidybase. The first is accessing the inferences. And the second is very flexibly plotting and summarizing uh, the results. So, um, I'll give an example of where I use tidy bays, and that's where I'm formatting the posterior estimates. So this is a, a model fit object. Um, this is the tidy bays code to gather the draws. And here I'm saying gather because I want them in this long denormalized format. There's a companion um, method called spread draws that would make them wide. And, and here I have my Y reps are indexed by I, which is my um, time point index. And then the Ys are also indexed by state index. And this function um, from Matthew K's group is, is like produces a really well formatted data frame that I can then quickly uh, join with the original data and um, summarize pretty flexibly. The second, uh, utility in tidy bays is this line ribbon where it's going to group and summarize and compute these nice sort of ribbons with uncertainty intervals um, dynamically as I plot them. So if I wanted to change the width or add additional widths, I can do it very quickly just by modifying this code and say, oh, I don't want a line ribbon. I want a point interval. Or instead of using credible intervals, use high density um, credible intervals. And so there's a lot of flexibility here to quickly summarize results uh, according to um, what you want to see. So that's the first uh, set of packages. Then there's command stand R, which is what I'm using to actually fit the model. Um, I use Plotly to show the posterior estimates in a way that allows me to turn certain traces on and off. And this is a bit of a convenience function. And then the last is R stand for the um, exposed stand functions. And this is the set of, this is the full set of packages that I've used. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, I hope this was a helpful kind of crash introduction to what's possible with Stan and um, in the context of SIR modeling and other contexts. And I will uh, share the code link as soon as it's posted. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, you can hear. Uh, we have a bit of delay in sound, so I receive your um, your voice 
um, later, but that's okay. Thank you very much. That was great. So we need to uh, um, that, that, I, I would have uh, many questions, but I, I think we are uh, the, we, we don't have much time to to go through all the things. I'm interested in understanding a bit more about how you set up the stun um, model and uh, uh, if you generally uh, set up it once and then you apply to uh, the other as uh, um, as you said, uh, if I'm not wrong, and um, on what basis uh, you um, basically uh don't, don't you do you find it uh how do you find it uh and um, how do you establish some parameters that are uh the, basically the starting points let's say you know okay so you sometimes somehow need to uh start somewhere and um what is your reasoning what are your thoughts when you uh basically set the parameters yeah Thanks. Yeah, so I heard, and I'll speak slowly because of the delay, and maybe I'll turn my video off in case that will help. Um, the first, I heard two questions in this. The first is around kind of the way that I set up the process. And um, you asked a question about do I typically have sort of one stand model that I keep reusing or am I constantly editing the stand code? And then the second question is around sort of how do you get started and in particular sort of initial values. And um, this is a very common problem in ODE modeling where the scale of parameters is very important to know a priori that um, you can have some parameters that are incredibly tiny and others that are very, very large. And you, it's actually very important to know kind of what values are reasonable before you start. And um, those are separate questions. So the first point I'll make is that in the, to the first question about how I set up things, I really leverage the functions block of stand code. And this allows me to create reusable components that I can both test in using exposed stand functions in R, but I can reuse them in multiple modeling contexts over time. So I'm building up libraries of functions that I can reuse. So I might have a library, um, a function that uh, implements saying a time varying effect with a spline. And that's something I can use across multiple modeling scenarios. And I'm familiar with how it works. I've tested it robustly, and this sort of gives me reusable components. Um, the model block and the parameters block often change. Um, when I have cases that are very, uh, in, in our, uh, at Generable, we develop stand models that we apply and reuse in biotech space, and there we actually keep exactly the same stand code. It's very heavily versioned because for that use case, it's a regulated industry. But that's separate from this exploratory mode. Um, this, the second question about initial values, there are kind of two approaches to take. Um, the first is to talk to people who know the area that I'm working on very well. So in the case of PKPD modeling, where sort of pharmacodynamic, you know, what is the typical clearance rate through the kidney for a molecule of this size? I don't know that a priori, but I will talk to experts to get good prior values for those. And then the second point is to use prior simulations. So the simulating data part is very important to see if the scale of parameters is reasonable. So if we simulated data for the SIR model where gamma was uh, you know, incredibly tiny, we would see population dynamics that don't look like anything we see in practice. So this would tell me, okay, I need to rescale this. I need this, this, these values are not appropriate. 
And there's a, there's a technique thing with say a cardiologist or an oncologist who's not a data person. I'll show them, here's my expectation of a patient's course of disease, one with who survives more than 10 years. And if my prior estimate to adjust my priors. Um, so there's a whole literature on eliciting prior priors from experts, but the initial sort of anecdotal way is, is very helpful just to see if they make sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Okay, I don't see if there's any other questions. I don't know if you, the audience, someone else would like to jump in and ask uh, um, some um, more specific question to Jacqueline. It's okay. So I don't. I don't see any other questions. All right. Okay. So I think we can. Yeah. Uh, what did you say? Something, Jacqueline? No. Sorry. I. I was. Um. I'm just here. I'm gonna unmute. Uh, bring my video back so you can see me. <laughs> okay. I think if there are no more questions, we can probably end a little bit early. That's good with the rest of the organizers. Great. So uh, I'll see, we'll see you next month with our ladies' room. Thank you. Yeah, great. We're looking forward to it. And yeah. our, our ladies' New York. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.